and we should be live. Let me check on that. It says we are live. I'm going to assume that we are. Um, <laughs> I am here. My name is Chris Robertson. I'm here with Augustus Invictus, and we are here to talk about <coughs> Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Um, contrary to most people's impressions of him, he was not a crazy lunatic, but was actually a relatively serious scholar and had some rather critical opinions about industrial technology. So I will let Augustus make the argument because I'm going to be arguing against his position. So Augustus, balls in your court. Radical. Well, I guess when you start off calling him by his FBI title, the UA bomber, that's uh that's starting off on the wrong foot, but um, I mean well, that's it how gives everybody people came an idea to know him anyway. Right. Yeah, well definitely. But I mean that's how everybody came to know of him at first, so it's probably not unfair. Uh, but as far as the argument goes, uh, he opens the first book uh, that was published in the newspapers to stop the bombings. Um, like the first line of it was that industrial society has irreparably harmed humankind. It has had disastrous uh, consequences for mankind and the globe. So his argument is that with the industrial society's advent, humanity started on a crash course to total annihilation. Um, and at this point, we haven't gotten quite to annihilation, but we certainly have gotten to what we might term technological slavery, where we are entirely enslaved in the technological system. And it's something that I think, you know, Kaczynski hasn't been out of prison since 97 or so. Uh, but I think, you know, in the past 20 years or so, we've seen that humanity has unconsciously accepted this fact. We know that we are enslaved to the system. Now, you see movies coming out of Hollywood left and right about, you know, the Terminator this and Skynet that and, you know, iRobot and all these different dystopian futures where humanity is asleep at the wheel and handing over, um, you know, the keys to... AI or to machines in general. Um, so there is some part of the unconscious that recognizes the state that we're in. But if you talk to people about the dangers of something like artificial intelligence, which, you know, the Trump administration just came out with this whole uh, task force to promote artificial intelligence, uh, people just laugh. It's like talking about UFOs. You know, you talk about artificial intelligence and you're the insane person. Uh, because you think there might be a danger to it. Uh, Kaczynski, same treatment. He makes the argument that there's an industrial society that is destroying humanity. It has enslaved humanity. It's making us worse. It's not progressing anything. Uh, and it's, by the way, destroying our natural environment. And Kaczynski is the crazy one. So the argument basically is industrial society is an absolute evil that cannot be controlled, cannot be reasoned with, cannot be regulated or barricaded. And the second half of his argument is, therefore, we must revolt against it and destroy it. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell, I reckon. Okay. And uh, just for some backstory, what, what got you interested in Kaczynski? And what, was, what was the most persuasive argument for you about his position, since we're doing this kind of informally the most influential argument for me um i mean i suppose when i was uh, introduced to his work i mean it was kind of finding a kindred spirit it wasn't i read this work and you know had a eureka moment where oh that's right you know we're we're on a crash course and nature is going to be destroyed and so are we it was i already felt that way and here's the person who had already put it into words when I was just a little kid. Um, but if I had to talk about one argument that really spoke to me on an intellectual level, um, I'd say it was in Anti-Tech Revolution, his most recent book, where he talked about uh, Mao. Now he's, he's always talked about a lot of different revolutionary leaders. He even talks about the Founding Fathers. And in that book, he goes through all these revolutionary movements. Um, and I've always pushed for revolution just in a different sphere of action. 
Uh, but he's talking about Mao and Mao's contention that, you know, a revolutionary has to play on this, uh, the main contradiction in a people. You know, what is that thing that the people must stand for and uh, what is that thing they must stand against? There has to be a black and white conflict, a clear line, and you have to be on the right side of it, right? And to Kaczynski, it is wild nature versus technology. That is the conflict. And to me, that is, is perfectly accurate. Um, and I, I couldn't have said it better myself, I guess. Okay. Um, and I guess one more question before I get into my take on it. Um, can you run us through what the power cycle is? Oh, you mean uh, for the leftists? Um, well, yes. Uh, and, and the leftist psychoanalysis that he provides in the beginning of right. industrial society is um, excellent. But my understanding of that was that the left, his psychoanalysis of the leftists was merely a case in point of right. how he That's thought it. industrial society interrupted or stymied the power cycle. Right, or the power process. Power um, process, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. that's it was a little unfamiliar. It just came out of the blue. So that's how mm. I remember it is, you know, he used the leftist as the example of right. the power process being uh, inhibited by industrial society. So to him, the power process is where, and I'm going to butcher this because this is not a scientific assessment. This is a paraphrase, just as my disclaimer. Um, the power process is that process through which an individual goes um, to basically reach a self-actualized state. And, and maybe not self-actualized in the sense of Maslow and psychology and all that, but in the sense that he feels, you know, a man feels he has control over himself, his environment, his life. Um, and it used to be we'd have things like initiation. Uh, where, you know, a man becomes a member of a tribe and he goes through an initiation to become a member of that tribe. And that was a, a very powerful statement that he has come into the world. A rite of uh, passage. Right, right. And we have no rites of passage anymore. Um, and this is exacerbated by the fact of industrial society. So we're all just cogs in this machine. There's no control over the environment. Uh, and again, that's his argument that we are all enslaved to this technology. And it's not like... You know, the, the modern argument that we're all slaves to our cell phones or, you know, the computer and Facebook because we can't get off it. Because that's that's not enslavement. That's more addiction. Uh, the enslavement aspect is not any, you know, one piece of technology, but the technological system itself, which means the entirety of it, not just the Internet, you know, not just the automobiles, but everything from Honda to Facebook to, you know, the IRS to... Uh, I don't know, construction workers and developers, um, everything that you think of as the system, that is what we are enslaved to. And when you have no power over that, and when you really can't determine your own life, because if you sit down and think about it for just 10 minutes, you really don't have any power over this system. Uh, and you have a very limited scope uh, of ability to determine your own life. And those people who really can't have any influence on the direction their life takes, those people become leftists. I and mean, that's, that's basically the crux of the argument because they are so frustrated uh, in their ability to overcome obstacles and to be their own person and to be independent uh, and self-reliant that then they seek this inclusion in a larger group. And that's where they fulfill their uh, need for the power process by joining in this large group by identifying with some minority group uh, with which they have no real connection. Um, they therefore fulfill that uh, need, that psychological need that all humanity has to go through this power process. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a, it, it's been a few days since I went through the material um, at your reading on your website. You read it very well, by the way, everyone should go check it out. Um, Tell me. I, uh, I came by Kaczynski myself after reading Matthew Crawford and listening to Tristan Harris, both of which, and you, you said it wasn't that, uh, that addiction is different than slavery. 
um, from a. No, I think I think it is different in that you know if you're saying all oh, these kids today they're slaves to their cell phones, like, I think that's like sure. colloquialism. You know, I don't think they're really enslaved to their cell phones, uh, but we are existentially enslaved to the technological system. Right, right, and and well, that's one of the points that Matthew Crawford and Tristan Harris bring up is that the. I mean, when you consider a heroin addiction, that's not that's not like some kid on their cell phone. That's a that's a very very serious dependency that can be <clears throat> absolute hell to get out of, you know. And and I think f from a from an outside looking in mechanistic perspective, it can be easy for us to say, well, that's not slavery. That's an addiction. But from the experiential uh, phenomenological perspective, the two can be almost interchangeable, I would say. And, and so I, I have yeah. my very, very serious concerns with technology, particularly with the way that technology seizes and divides our attention. When you consider that who we are is in many ways just the product of what we direct our attention towards. The fact that technology not only seizes our attention but breaks it down so that we can't concentrate on one thing for long periods of time and develop that depth of attention and understanding. Um, I, I think that many manifestations of um, modern technology are, are existential threats to us as authentic individuals, um, which is a it's almost more terrifying than conventional slavery because it makes us in some sense uh, participants in our own enslavement oh well, uh, yeah and there's the whole rhetoric about you're actually your own boss you know, right you're your master these things they free you to do whatever you want your cell phone your computer your automobile gives you the freedom to drive wherever you want but when you back up out of the picture and you look at it actually you have your car so that you can drive an hour to work every morning and sit there for nine hours and then drive an hour home and then you don't ever want to get in the car again. Then you do it all over the next day. And your phone's there so that, you know, not so you have the freedom to do this and that, but that so that you can get a hold of people and people can get a hold of you and you can never get away from your phone. So when you, you know, take it from a bird's eye view, these things, they do have the power to possibly you from a certain situation but at the same time they're really chaining you down but right. very subtly right so so i wanted to begin with that partial concession because there are dangers to technology um however um i i would want to begin with a with a look back at a platonic dialogue called phaedrus in which socrates is talking to another gentleman um, and this gentleman is going on about the wonderful invention of writing that a, mm -hmm. the Egyptian god Thoth, I believe, <coughs> handed down to his people. I could be getting that mixed up. Um, no, that sounds about right. And yeah, Thoth was the Egyptian god of writing and magic. Right. And, and he's explaining this wonderful gift that the Egyptians received uh, of being able to write. And Socrates says, that's very nice. You, you think this is a wonderful gift, but it is, in fact, a curse writing um in embodying your memory in this on, on the paper you actually lose the ability to remember things yourself and you become dependent upon the writing and people will and because the greeks thought and not without reason that memory was an important part of thinking that losing one's memory because you're writing things down will not only make people forgetful but also stupid now, well, I'd actually I'd agree with him on mm -hmm. that. I, I know that sounds a little insane, but um, I think that's true. Well, it's it's like, not insane, you, but but there is a there is a clear it, it's a it's a trade off that we're being offered because there is a cost in memory to writing, but at the same time it opens us up to the writings of other people whose thoughts we would not have thought otherwise. I can read. Aquinas and Augustine and Plato himself and Aristotle and um, I can I can read 
the Bible and the Book of the Law and all sorts of other thoughts from from authors, the smartest authors in all the world. That's true. And given but how I mean, society that, has again, progressed, again, that's that's a trade off, though. Again, because right. the, the you know the trade off is, do you really want to know all these things? I mean, there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with our local cultures that are influencing us because, oh, this person in I don't know, China wrote this thing, you know, a thousand years ago, and let's try to apply that to our business practices. Um, in ancient times, you had no opportunity to do that because the local academics, um, they knew everything about the history. You know, there, there are tribes in Africa where they have a sage who knows the family history of everybody in the tribe back a thousand years. Um, but there are also more modern studies done, uh, not just Socrates, but um, say Francis Yates, which I know it's ironic to quote a book about this, but uh, Francis Yates sure. uh, wrote The Art of Memory, and mm -hmm. she goes into all of these just astounding feats of memory where people would create, you know, the, the mind palaces of Sherlock Holmes, um, where they would, you know, make Cicero. these total, like, amphitheaters in their minds and, you know, catalog things and be able to access them, things that we have no idea how to do today. They're not taught in schools, not taught in universities. There's no group of sages or professors who have any idea how to do these things. But they are in uh, books. It's gone. Yeah, they're in books oh. for us to marvel at the ancient wonders, you know, like the pyramids of Egypt. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how to reconstruct these things. Um, so you're right. There is a trade-off where, you know, I can read Aristotle, and I love Aristotle. Um, but at the same time, my memory is shit. <laughs> compared to Aristotle. Yeah. And, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Yeah. I, I think that um, we can we can look at an old analog to gauge whether it's a good thing in an objective sense or not by looking at our ancestors about 40, 42 to 46,000 years ago. Our major competitors, the Neanderthals, were probably smarter than us were stronger than us there is some evidence that indicates that they were better tool makers than us they were more resistant to the cold than us and they were more resistant to attacks than us the one advantage we had was we had a slightly sharper shaped larynx that allowed us to create a broader variety of sounds that broader variety of sounds allowed us to have a more elaborate and precise language by which we could communicate and organize with each other. Now, in the technical sense, language is a technology. And perhaps, one could argue, the fact that we relied upon this language and social organization and dependence on others was what allowed us to become weaker and maybe not quite as intelligent as the Neanderthals. But ultimately, right. we wiped them out. Well, I think this might be the point to bring up that, you know, Kaczynski is not saying that, and neither am I, that all technology is across the board evil. Um, his point is that there's a difference between, and this is a more subtle point most people mm. don't see in his writings, but he says there's a difference between <clears throat> large-scale uh, technologies and small-scale technologies. So if you're talking about small-scale, uh, like the making of spears and knives, um, the, the ability to build houses, um, to, to, you know, put a yoke on an ox and plow your fields, like those things, people are going to make those up tribally, they're going to make them up all over the world, you know, except Africa, but that's another discussion. But in large-scale technologies, those things collapse with a civilization. So when Rome collapsed, nobody was making aqueducts anymore. They just completely lost that technology on how to build these massive buildings, these massive infrastructure projects. It was just gone, and it had to be rediscovered hundreds of years later. So if you know the industrial society collapsed right now, no one would have any idea how to you know, make cars from scratch. Like you have to have factories for that. For factories, you have to have electricity. All these things are interdependent upon one another. So if the large scale industrial society collapses, we go back to small scale technology. And that would, you know, that would include, granted, um, writing, 
Uh, it would include, you know, weapons making um, and possibly automobiles if people were really that determined to make them from scratch. Right. But um, for the most part, you know, the, the society itself and the infrastructure we have, it would completely collapse, you know, fight club style. Well, the, the reason that I brought up writing as my first counterexample was that Socrates' critique of writing was essentially the same in its substance as Kaczynski's <laughs> critique of industrial uh, technology. Now, I think there are some gray zones as to what qualifies as industrial. Uh, is the loom or the printing press industrial, for example? You could make a strong case, that I think, in either direction. But any technology at all, any dependence upon tools, period, has the same um, effect. Not to the same scale, but it has... the. the the, the argument is essentially the same or could be made the same. We become enslaved to the objects that we are dependent upon and it makes our power process easier and therefore in his argument less um, less meaningful. Now I, I'd like to, to argue against that but one of the reasons I in, in a little bit but one of the reasons I brought up the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens is that in anthropological circles, one of the big points of fascination is with uh, matriarchal societies. And mm -hmm. matriarchal societies have existed around the world in the past. Um, the problem is that they get wiped out whenever they come across a patriarchal society. It seems no. that it seems that when when men don't have a known investment in their society, they're less likely to fight for it. And so matriarchal societies get wiped out by patriarchal ones whenever they come into conflict. And if one society were to give up on industrial technology in the same way, they would be giving up on the power that industrial society brings with it. Right. Like like the the Homo sapiens, if we had given up the the power of language in order to pursue the the strength and speed and cold resistance of the Neanderthals, we may have been the ones wiped out. Right, and there's a twofold response to that. One is uh, Spangler, who wrote *Man and Technics*. Uh, he's the guy that wrote *Decline of the West*. For those that don't know, but in *Man and Technics*, he's talking about that exact point that you know what makes the Western soul, besides it being the Faustian spirit, this striving for the infinite, is our technical ability. You know, everything that defines Western civilization has to do with techniques. It has to do with machinery. But at this point, we've gotten to a point where it's, you know, the machine has surpassed its creator, you know, like Frankenstein or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the second fold point to that is Kaczynski, uh, who, you know, his argument is not we as Americans should disarm, you know, like the, the anti-nuke people who think we should disarm our nukes and all of a sudden we're going to have world peace he says in his book uh, anti-tech revolution that obviously you know one country is not just going to destroy its own technological foundation like that would be suicide absolutely um if america did it then europe would take over or the chinese would attack us or whatever and if china did it then their country would be destroyed and we'd just grow in power so right you know and that's the practical failure um is how do you do that i mean he recognizes that problem and he's saying therefore we have to have this you know like revolutionary cadre like like a linen type vanguard that just destroys this system worldwide the question is how the fuck do you do something that massive right and that's where you know who knows who knows mm -hmm. I, and i don't think kaczynski pretends to know either yeah, well, well, specifically dealing with the Western dominance of technology, I was chatting with a, a friend of mine about Chinese history, and we were going over the question of, of how did, why did China not have a warrior aristocracy? They had it, an aristocracy, but it was a bureaucratic aristocracy. If you were a mm -hmm. magistrate, if you were a scribe, that was the position of power. So they had soldiers, but they were kind of looked down on in the way that serfs were looked down on in in mid-century Europe. So what what happened there? And it, it by my friend's uh, hypothesis, the very early invention of the crossbow 
rendered ordinary people so okay. power powerful in combat that the warrior aristocracy had no place anymore and it was mm -hmm. it was arguably for this reason that the catholic church banned the crossbow in much of europe by the time that europe got around to inventing the thing too so um they cr technology had a profound effect on on china long before europe was um in inventing these sorts of things so i don't think we have the the dominance of of technology and even if we were to completely abdicate uh as the west as a group uh our technology that still might not be enough when you include asia and africa right. has its own strengths outside of of technology we can say <laughs> Um, that we're right because I to think experience. you know if we stop sending them weapons, they might not be able to produce them themselves. Right, and then they'd be in a different situation. Well, they've got they've got a, a, a population boom that we're we're about to feel in a big way, but we're getting yeah we're getting and again, which is our fault because we keep sending them food and medicine and, and making sure that they you know don't follow the evolutionary practices they've been following for tens of thousands of years. Um, but yeah, that's a different discussion, I reckon. Right. So, so it seems to me that we would not just need to unilaterally disarm the West of industrial technology right. and perhaps more than just industrial, but the entire world of that technology. Right. I'd agree with you there. If you're going to destroy the industrial society, it has to be worldwide. Okay. Like destroying it in the Western civil, Western countries, uh, would just be amount, it would amount to suicide on our part. So... I'm not content with just the necessity argument. There's there's two more arguments I want to make though, because if we stop, if we were to stop here for some reason, we'd be leaving it. Well, yeah, that is a good ideal to strive for, but it's not doable. But it still would be good to strive for. I actually think, while while completely granting the dangers that technology, many of the dangers that technology can pose, um, there's a couple points that I think he misses out on, which is, the, and the first being pre-industrial people, there's a point that he makes that pre-industrial people were more psychologically well-adjusted and, and happy than post-industrial people. And he says, now you may think that the fact that we're living longer and healthier lives means we'd be more um, psychologically well-adjusted. But you'd mm -hmm. be wrong. Those two things don't necessarily correlate together. And he's right. However, when you go back and read the old texts, when you read Job, for example, or the Iliad, or the Epic of Gilgamesh, you come across people who are so profoundly struck by the... the by the power of nature, that they sometimes ascribed to the gods, um, sometimes to just to nature itself, They're, and and the the sadness they fear feel. I mean, when you read Job, it's like this is a guy who who rent his clothes and ripped his hair, covered himself in ash, and sat in silence for three days. That's that's a when you think about what it would take to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I didn't say I was listening. Okay, when when you think about what it would take to to cause you to feel that degree of despair and sadness i mean people in modern society do experience that that uh no doubt about it but this is a centerpiece in in ancient uh stories it's not like the ancient people were unfamiliar with with not just suffering but with with the, the psychological damage that suffering caused. There's one extraordinarily interesting and, in my opinion, underrated psychologist named um, Julian Jaynes. He wrote a book called Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And the, he he's a neuroscientist of sorts, and there's a, a parts of your brain called Broca's area and Wernicke's area that have to do with language processing. And there are uh, parallel parts of the brain in the other hemisphere that we don't necessarily know what they do, but we know that they communicate with each other. And based on his analysis of literature and his understanding of neurology, he's convinced that the other part of our brain across from Broca's and Wernicke's area is 
responsible for producing interior dialogue. When we talk to ourselves, that's what's going on. Except in ancient times, you keep hearing these people, they'll generate their own thoughts, but they will ascribe them to gods. And what his hypothesis is, is that the, the fact that the corpus callosum, which is the, the connections between the right and the left hemisphere, maybe those weren't developed. And so their own interior monologues sounded external to themselves. So they were running around hearing voices coming from inside their own head, but they sounded like voices of angels, gods, deities, other people's dead friends, so on and so forth. What would cause such a thing? was a weird world full of schizophrenic zombies running around hearing voices. His p part of the hypothesis is that, uh, and we see this a little bit, we see a regression to this in people with severe PTSD. Exposure to so much suffering, so much tragedy, so much pain in the old world that the corpus callosum didn't develop in the way that it does in modern people. And this was pretty normal cross site. This is a sort of speculative neurology. But it matches what most people uh, read out of ancient historical texts. The, the, amount of, the amount of suffering and the psychological maladjustments um, that we experienced as a result of that seems to indicate that we've become more psychologically well-adjusted over time. Now, I think that might be overstating it because from what... I know of what we know about happiness, happiness seems to normalize pretty much no matter where we're at. People, pe if you experience a certain amount of, of suffering, you can become adapted to that. Um, so I don't think we've become, this is strange after putting out the, the origins of consciousness argument, but well, I, I think it's, you could reasonably say that we haven't necessarily become more psychologically adjust. Uh, well adjusted and i think social media and all these other sorts of things have some hand in that but we're certainly not worse off than the ancients there may have been a few exceptional individuals among the ancients who were extraordinarily well adjusted but the fact that they came up with such incredible and effective coping mechanisms and philosophies and religious doctrines that were effective in generating psychological health i think spoke to a deep need for those philosophies and psychological um, psychological technologies to be healthier. So I don't think that Kaczynski is right in saying that the pre-industrial man was more psychologically well adapted. Yeah, see, I would retort that it sounds like an atheist argument that he's trying to figure out where did you know all this talk about these gods come from? Clearly these people were insane. Because gods don't talk to people, uh, and to my mind, they do, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's the mark of mental illness in this day and age, is that if you do hear the voice of God, clearly you're batshit insane, which is ironic because Kaczynski actually is a pretty devoted atheist. Right. So I don't know what his retort would be to the origins of consciousness argument, but to me it sounds like, like you said, it's speculative neurology. It's looking backwards to say. Why don't these people fit our standard of what a mentally adjusted person should be? So I'm not fully convinced by the argument that these people just didn't have developed brains. And I also retort uh, that if you read something like uh, you mentioned the Iliad, right? <clears throat> and if you read something or watch the play of Sophocles Ajax, uh, that's about Ajax coming back from the war and being totally insane and slaughtering and just out of his mind with madness so they did understand what madness was right and there were warriors who were who went through the 10-year war and didn't crack you know they came back and they were i wouldn't say fine but they certainly didn't go mad they clearly had an understanding in ancient times of difference between you know hearing the voices of gods and being insane and hearing the voices of gods because you are a pious person who just happens to get messages from these people. Certainly. And, and as, a, as a Christian, I am certainly on the side of, of, of believing that people can communicate with, with God. Um, just because some people can speak to and hear from God doesn't mean everybody who claims to 
uh, is is sane, though, of course. It is, yeah, it's and telling the, the truth. No, no doubt about that. I mean, there are clearly schizophrenic people. There are clearly, you know, right. people who are insane, people who do think that they're Napoleon or Jesus Christ. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing there's no such thing as mental illness. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that I don't think that it's a, you know, sound argument to say that ancient people had something wrong with their brains because they don't conform to what we think of as sane. Sure. And my argument I, I'd say wasn't just the reverse is true. I, I wasn't trying to to suggest that uh, ancient peoples, because their brain had developed differently in order to adapt to the environment that they lived in, were in some ways, in any way, dumber or, or worse off or um, inferior to us. I'm, I'm trying to, to say that they developed differently in order to adapt to a different set of circumstances than what we live in. And the fact that those circumstances involved so much cruelty and suffering and trauma relative to what we have today um, and you can see the reactions to it in these ancient texts. Um, Gilgamesh was crying for days over the death of Enkidu, for example. Right. Um, and of course, we both know Achilles' reaction to um, to Patrocles dying. But I think the, the perhaps the saddest scene in that whole story is when, when Hector is speaking with Andromache, and Andromache, you know, the background with Hector's wife is that all seven of her brothers and her father were killed by Achilles. And now her husband is going out to fight this guy as well. And it's just like there's – it's hard to even fathom – I mean before your husband even goes to fight this guy, that's already an immense amount of loss and suffering and a feeling of instability about the, the world. Um and again, I'm not trying to say that, that these people were necessarily psychologically less well-adjusted than us. I think their brains developed differently in order to normalize their experience of happiness. But the experience of stress and trauma and despair and hopelessness are as old as the species. And I think, yeah. it's, I think to say that it's, we've reached a new height of this because of industrialized technology and we're seeing this manifest in depression and suicide and drugs and modern leftism and so on. Um, there's... I like how you include leftism with suicide and drugs. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <And> old... <laughs> no, yeah. but I think there's a, a, one of the big differences between what you're describing in the Iliad or even, you know, that was happening in the middle ages uh, and something today is just basically meaning you know, and the meaningfulness of death and tragedy and suffering. So, you know, when uh, uh, her whole family had been slaughtered and then Hector is killed too and then dragged around in the chariot, um, all eight of them died because they were defending Troy. It wasn't a surprise. Um, they knew what they were doing. That was a man's duty. They fulfilled that duty. And in those times, um, that was the best death possibly have was on the battlefield mm -hmm. whereas you know somebody who's 60 years old has lost all his or her family to car wreck boating accident cancer uh you know whatever other random stupid ways to die uh it's the same thing but totally without meaning absolutely devoid of meaning so the entire world seems like this grand fucking circus act there is no God. There is, you know, no order in this universe. So I think, you know, from my perspective, that makes it infinitely worse. I would rather lose all my family when my cities burn to the ground because at least I know what they died for than, you know, my wife and all our kids die in a fucking, I don't know, gas explosion. Like, it just seems like a, a different magnitude of order to lose your family to the absurd ways we all die today, as opposed to at least you'd got to stand a fighting chance back then. Well, I mean, that may have been true of Hector. I mean, most of the people who died in ancient times, so far as we can tell, died extraordinarily painful deaths of their teeth and of disease and of accidents, drowning at sea, 
being willied by animals or or bandits, so on and so forth. And there are certainly glorious deaths. I would I would say that there are glorious deaths in modern time too. I I think of the the astronauts that came down in that ball of flame a few years back. A, a terrible way to go, but when you think about it, but also glorious. also one hell of a way to go. You know, absolutely. Um, could it's it's up there with exploding helicopters in. <laughs> I, ideal ways to to die um and i i think one of my favorite psychologists is a guy named victor frankel who is follows from the the nietzschean and freudian school of psychoanalysis but for him Ni uh, freud focused on pleasure nietzsche focused on power um but frankel focused primarily on meaning and purpose and in his experience in World War II, it seems that the prisoners that he was around, that he was around, because he himself was a, a prisoner in the death camps, um, I believed in Poland, and he said that the the people who had something to live for, even even if it was something small and petty, had a better chance of making it out than the people who did not. And that was just an observation he had, and he developed his whole school of logotherapy based on that observation and and so this is a very um it's a it's a true point i think but it's not one that industrial technology necessarily uh diminishes and can even in some cases improve um this is a point that matthew crawford brings up but i want to give you a chance to throw in a word or two before i just go on another monologue <laughs> no i no, you please do. I'm, I'm going to give you the Viktor Frankl argument because I, there's, there is nothing nice I have to say about Frankl. So I'm just I'm going to let you oh, go to okay, okay. go to well, your Crawford argument. I, I can't even talk about Frankl. Sure. In a in a gentlemanly manner. My 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 hope is that the the argument that he's making is true beyond yeah. the speaker. Um, and, right and his so, own character. You know, people searching for meaning. Yeah, right. I, I I'm gonna just agree with you on that. Aside from going what, what, into the, the and historical his... origins of, yeah, of his right. <laughs> yes claim, uh, and you could say that Nietzsche pre predated um, Frankel in the argument too. Nietzsche in his uh, <laughs> in his style will say in a sentence or two what other people say in an entire book. So when he says a, a man who has a why can withstand almost any how, um, right? You've you you get the gist of the argument without having to go into World War II and the conclusions we might derive from that. Um, but speaking of Nietzsche, Nietzsche's concept of happiness was feeling an increase in your power, and for Nietzsche, yeah. the the necessity of it was not as critical as it is for. Kaczynski, uh, just feel becoming more competent at something, becoming stronger than something, is is worthwhile in and of itself, even if it isn't necessary. One of the things that Kaczynski sort of um, mocked in industrial society in its future were people who focused excessively on their own bodies in in weightlifting and strength training. Yeah, and also people who had very specialized jobs. Exactly. Saying, Look, you don't need any of these things to survive. But to be fair, I think, you know, Kaczynski and, and Nietzsche were in different environments where, you know, Nietzsche was a college professor, like, vacationing in the fucking Alps. Like, what what a right. life. Uh, and Kaczynski was living in a cabin by himself for 30 years, like, just trying to battle the wilderness. So I, they had just very different living positions, even granted Nietzsche's, you know, chronic physical illness. I just think they had different ways of you know understanding what power means to human beings sure because nietzsche was talking about you know the great men of history um caesar and alexander and napoleon and kaczynski's talking about man as an individual against nature and, i mean kaczynski right. and nietzsche are both you know two of my biggest intellectual influences so i'm not saying one or the other is correct or incorrect uh, i just think they were coming from two different perspectives sure well one of the points that crawford brings up is that Nietzsche wasn't talking about power as as dominance over other people, at least not exclusively. 
And I think right. Nietzsche clarified this in a letter he wrote to a friend where he said, you know, I've met more powerful and noble men who are, you know, gardeners who stay at home and who who refine and hone their craft and, and create, you know, beautiful gardens and, and cook beautiful, wonderful food than a lot of these, you know, politicians and, you know, so-called powerful uh, people elsewhere. All right. Who um, higgle and howl for power with the rabble. Exactly. Yes. And so technology, I mean, to go back to strength for a second, um, back in the 1800s or so, people, there were, there were weight trainers. They were usually in circuses and, and were uh, clowns in the, in the technical sense. And they would do exercises, of course, to get strong. But the, the weights that they used were uh they used lead shot in balls on the end of their bars and that limited how much weight they could put on the the bar and they had to do they had to get the bar onto their shoulders if they were to do a squat for example or a or a clean or something by standing it on its end and rolling it back onto their back before they could begin the exercise brutal it was very difficult yes it was only, and that limited how much weight they could get on. It was only in the the mid twentieth century that we began making plates and we began making racks to put the barbells on. And what that did is it allowed us to lift heavier weights, to get more and heavier weight onto our back and to lift it, and. Um, and that's an in, that was something made possible by industrial technology. Another point that Crawford brings up is uh, Crawford himself got his PhD in I want to say the history of political thought before he uh, got a job at a think tank, quit that in disgust after five months, and reopened his motorcycle repair shop, um, <laughs> and continued continued with that. And one of the arguments he makes is that you know repair work is and work with your hands is in many ways more cognitively demanding and rewarding than uh working on on paper or at a computer oh absolutely so called white collar like work. I've, I've worked in the gym for you know four hours a day for the past eight mm -hmm. months and i've also been you know a fellow at a human rights institute and it's far more rewarding working out of the gym oh yeah and, well, know, and some I of these gym guys the are gym fucking and, smart too some oh yeah, these, uh, they, like scientists. the nutrition they talk about, the the systems they have, like they have it figured out. And like like I was saying, I drive to the gym and I use the, you know, squat rack at the gym. Mm -hmm. I'm not you know bending over, rolling it over like a like an 1800s power lifter. So I'm not saying you know I don't use these things. Like clearly these are better ways to train and they're better ways to get around. Um, mm -hmm. There are better ways to do all these things that we're talking about. But the argument isn't that, you know, we wouldn't use these technological advances if they're right in front of us. The argument is, you know, we'd cars, be better off without them. Well, no, that, that you become enslaved to them as they become generally accepted. True. So cars, for instance, you know, it gives me a greater freedom. I don't have to walk the two miles to the gym. I probably should, but I don't because I have the car and it's faster, et cetera. Right. And, you know, that's great. But the point is that with the general acceptance of the automobile, it made roads and it made distances traveled more commonplace. So now nobody's in the same neighborhood. People travel an hour away for work, which is, you know, 50 miles to 60 miles away uh, for work every morning. And you've become now trapped in this automobile it's not granting you the freedom to get there anymore and that analogy might break down in the gym because you know i couldn't imagine you know lifting these lead shot things that that sounds like it would be terrible um but there is something to be said for our ancestors who did ancient strength training without the use of squat racks I mean, they had you know rocks and boulders and milo was the guy that lifted a cow you yep. know uh, every day as it grew and that's how he became the strongest man in the village so you know we have all these modern advances in weightlifting today um, but we don't really need them I mean we had strength training for thousands of years before right well the the need I, I 
think would go to to two things first to um the necessity argument i brought before with china and islam and so on and so forth um but the second thing where the need comes from i would say is uh women um women like civilization i think more than men do and uh we hundred percent we uh we do these things for our, for our ladies so that they will love us and be content in the in the houses that we build oh them. yeah it's difficult to convince your wife to <laughs> move with the kids out to the wilderness because i right. want to be a man right <laughs> you're gonna say all right well you go be a man i'm gonna move in with roger who's mm-hmm. gonna be my new husband he's an investment banker <laughs> with a nice apartment exactly so um but the the greater point of crawford is that in becoming a motorcycle technician the the industrial technology that is the motorcycle or um the violin you could say or the pipe organ provide us means of developing competence as well these are extraordinarily complicated devices and they require us to submit ourselves and our ego to the objective reality in front of us we have to learn what the the entity is we're working with whether it's a motorcycle or a nation or the or the english language because remember in, the language is a technology as well and it's a trapping technology if i learn english there are certain sounds that i can no longer produce i can't say um due to my upbringing i can't pronounce a spanish r i can't do it and there are, there are other sort of guttural uh linguistic sounds that other people can't make and and we like to make fun of them for this japanese people can have an extremely difficult time differentiating between the r and the l sound um much to our western amusement um so so all sorts of things constrain us which it's actually an interesting story about that in the uh have you seen the series on the unabomber like the discovery or whatever it was the eight-part miniseries no i haven't it just came out like last year. Yeah, there's a funny a part look. where they're they're getting the warrant for Kaczynski, and it's based on the analysis of his language, like his written language between the letters to his family mm. and the Unabomber manifesto. And the story that the judge tells before signing this warrant is that he was in the Korean War, and they had a code word, <laughs> you know, for people approaching in the night, and the code word was liberty, and when the approaching, you know, the approaching soldiers were asked for the code word, they said "river free," <laughs> and so they <laughs> knew they were not American, and they slaughtered them all. That's so that, that was actually how he justified signing this warrant. I mean, I'm sure right. that's just made up for the show, but yeah. it's a it's a true um, sentiment there. Yeah, and and the the point of that, I mean, you could you could make it even more basic and say that our our human body constrains us contrary to uh whatever gender fluid people we have out there we can't uh we can't fly with the bodies that we have we need we need airplanes to do that um nor can we run 70 miles an hour the way that the cheetah can our body constrains us and so the, the the thing that matthew crawford that i liked about him that he focuses on is that the goal is not freedom the goal is agency and I think Kaczynski would would agree with this to to some degree, um, from from my reading of him. It's that it's that feeling of power over your environment, even though that power isn't, you know, absolute. You can't you don't have infinite choices. You have maybe five choices, and you try to choose the best one. And these choices are um, offered to us by the by our environment. Basically, if I'm playing a violin, there's only four strings. I can play on and there's only so many finger positions I can use on each string and it's those limitations that give us the choices in some sense because if there was infinite positions on infinite strings on a violin there would almost be no such thing as music at least from the violin's perspective so so the technology that we are dealing with the industrial technology cars computers give us not just um they do give us all sorts of constraints but within those constraints and because of those constraints they give us the opportunity to develop competence as well whether it's repairing the car or networking your parents 
uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> you know, they can sometimes have a hard time with that. Yeah, sure. I and, mean, and there's so, yeah, there's no argument here that you have different opportunities to become competent. And you know, I mean, take jet mechanics. You know, something that the ancients had no concern of. Um, there's certainly plenty of room for people to improve and you know become more intelligent, etc. Uh, but you you could make the same argument about things past. I mean, the memory games, for instance, that we mm -hmm. had talked about earlier, or playing the flute, uh, or horsemanship. Nobody rides horses anymore. Right. Um, you know, shipbuilding, like the Vikings. We don't do that anymore. Now we build massive, you know, metal uh, battleships. Um, so there there are differences certainly, but I, I don't think that you need you know large scale technology systems. Uh, in order to become a competent person or to gain power over in your environment uh, or anything like that. Certainly, no, no argument there. The, 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 the argument is not we need this technology in order to develop competence. It's that the technology doesn't inhibit us from developing competence and participating in the power process. And well, in certain areas, perhaps not, but in certain areas it does. Because there are, you know, different things like uh, automobiles, for instance, the, mm -hmm. the motorcycle, right? So right. this guy, he's, uh, I, what book is this, by the way? Um, he's got two books. They're both exceptional. The first one is called Shop Class as Soulcraft. And the second one is called um, The World Beyond Your Head. I actually wrote a review of it on Countercurrents last oh. month, I believe. I'll check that out. All right, so this guy is a, a motorcycle repairman. Right, mm -hmm. so he's spending this time working on his motorcycle, um, and certainly he's not inhibited from learning something else. But the time spent on that means he is not learning <clears throat> how to ride a horse. It's an opportunity cost. Uh, exactly, right. It's a trade-off. So, you know, you're not being inhibited from learning these ancient practices. Just like mm -hmm. you know, uh, you and I are writers. Uh, we're not inhibited from learning the art of memory, uh, according right. to the ancients, but. You know, in pure practical terms, we just, we can't. There's just, you don't have the time to do that and be a writer. It's impossible. Um, and, and all the other trade-offs in the world are the same way. Like having a cell phone, it's not inhibiting you from, I don't know, learning how to sail or mountain climbing. Um, but if you spend all your time on social media, you're not going to be sailing or mountain climbing. Oh, like absolutely. This, this, yeah, it's just a trade-off. It's not inhibiting you. Uh, per se, but in practical terms, you're, you inhib inhibition doesn't mean anything because it's already gone. Well, I mean, the Kaczynski's argument is that this technology, the industrial technology, prevents us ultimately in the long run from going through the power cycle. Oh, I see. Power I process. see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would. I think that might be a misunderstanding of the argument because I don't think he would say. Uh, you know, that motorcycles uh, or or weightlifting equipment, you know, any of these specific pieces of technology would prevent you from fulfilling the power process. Mm -hmm. I think what he's saying is the system itself, like the whole thing put together, um, that does. So, you know, having a car gives you the freedom to go to the grocery store faster. Yes. But having a car and a job that's across town and kids that are in two different schools on other sides of town, uh, that's the system itself. And that is what has you enslaved. So, I, I, yeah, I, I think you you got to draw the distinction between, you know, individual pieces of equipment, uh, right. even those that might be produced by industrial society, and the society as a whole, which is what his actual enemy is. Well, that that's sort of the argument that Heidegger makes about industrial technology as well. He, he thought that the end game of industrial technology would be that um, it would turn everything into potential energy waiting to be used by something else. It would turn everything into just the trees into lumber waiting to be mm -hmm. used in a house and that this would eventually include humans as well. We would all be human resources waiting to be used. Uh, Sounds on, on prophetic. Um, I think the thing that he missed though, and, and, call me a little bit arrogant for, for going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a mind like Heidegger, <laughs> or Kaczynski for that matter. Um, but this end scenario seems to never arrive. It's like the the um, the left-behind 
uh, <laughs> a- apocalypse where everyone gets pulled up. It's like it's gonna happen in 1996. Nope. Uh, it's gonna be 2002. Nope. It's gonna be the the end. The end point never seems to arrive. Socrates could have thought like we'd all be absolutely stupid by the year you know 1500 BC. That didn't work out. Um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm getting Homer and Socrates mixed up in the age, but you get the you get the point. Yeah, um, I think Socrates came around after right 1500 BC. But right. Yeah, Socrates I see what you're saying, but and, it seems to me like the frog in the frying pan. You just you mm-hmm. keep turning it up slowly, and eventually he's gonna cook. Well, well, let me tell you why I think that end time will never come, and and why it's it's not quite uh, going to happen. And the reason seems to be that people will use technology for their own ends that don't coincide with the grand plan or what appears to be the logically necessary terminus point of the essence of technology itself that's what heidegger was concerned with was the essence of technology and the 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 means for something else and and so you know say the government comes up with a new technology let's call it common core and they use this technology to try to make better more manageable uh more replaceable parts human resources out of their um civilians right seems like a decent plan um except wouldn't you know it all these pesky people out there are using the very information in common core as a tool against common core people like dr duke pesta or stefan molyneux or uh, any number of other people we can use technology for our own ends against the the utopian dream that is being imposed upon us and we do this consistently we do this with language satire is infuriating to the powers that be because they have such a hard time controlling it yeah but Um, i'd stay with the the electronic situation right there that you were on because mm -hmm. if you know the government bitcoin or ethereum well i would consider paypal airbnb Mm -hmm. uh facebook google youtube twitter uh, who else? Stripe, uh, Expedia. Yep. All They're... of those are companies that terminated our accounts at the Revolutionary Conservative, and mm-hmm. everybody associated with our company after Charlottesville. Yeah. Just wiped everything, annihilated funding. Um, <clears throat> absolutely nothing we could do. And it wasn't the government. Government didn't have to lift a finger. And there was. There's no fighting back. You know. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that the the government is the one central power and that's another point that that crawford makes is that he he sympathizes with libertarians in many ways but disagrees with the the old school libertarian idea that the government is the one true source of of all evil and misuse of power he's like ah corporations and corporations and marketing organizations and things like that can do this too particularly on our attention so on but we can use we can use and they will win victories and we will win victories and it 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 seems looking back across history like there's always this tension um but the the government never seems or the or the the powers that be we can say technology itself never seems quite able to to dominate the human spirit we always find some way of twist, twisting it back on itself. Maybe we'll create an app um, that controls the rest of technology. I have an app that I, I used to use on my old laptop for writing. It was called Freedom, incidentally. You had to pay for it, unfortunately. But you would, you would pull up the browser. You'd put in a time, say an hour. And it would disconnect your internet for an hour and you would have no ability to get it back until that hour had passed. You couldn't restart the computer and, and get it going again. No, you had to wait a full hour. And by manually choosing to, to use this tool, first of all, buying it makes you feel like you need to use it now too. So just the act of paying money is, is helpful in that regard. And then it's much easier to type in 6-0 enter than it is to actually stay off the internet for an hour. So we can use technology 
against this this technology as well and we always yeah i think that. that's that's playing right into the enslavement argument because mm-hmm. now you're not even your own master of your own agency making this decision to just end it with your own willpower you've now given that function over to an app that does it for you so now you don't have to use willpower to stop it so mm-hmm. i think that that in itself proves the enslavement argument just like a, a slave on a plantation Um, You know, you convince him that he and no, my family was not slave owners, SPLC, when you're listening to this, but a master (laughs) would say to his his slave, you know, I'm going to let you choose which suit you're going to you you're going to wear, you know, when we go to Charleston this weekend, Um, like like you do with a child, like, hey, buddy, uh, which one of these shirts you want to wear? It gives the illusion that they have a choice in the matter. They're going to wear one of the fucking shirts. Right. You know, not right. not up to them. They are, you know, he's a child. He doesn't get to choose. Yeah. Same thing's happening to us. Uh, we are children. We don't get to choose, you know, uh, whether to use social media. We only get to choose whether we prefer Instagram or Twitter. Well, this brings us back to the whole agency versus freedom argument. Freedom means, like, I, I have as many choices as I want. Agency is, like, I have a, a constrained number of choices, but those... I can still pursue it's not even my interests exactly but it's it's expanding this the the competence and power that I have over my own life and the utility the the tools that we use have less to do with it because we already use tools and and this is one of the points that I, I forgive me for keep coming back to this guy but but Crawford talks about with um what's known as embodied cognition When we write, for example, sorry, Socrates, um, we are using the paper as an extension of our memory. That's what the abacus did when it came to counting. It allowed people to store larger numbers on, not on their head, but on the abacus so that they didn't have to keep it in their head. Um, The spear, as I think I talked about in, in Defense of Hatred, it becomes an extension of the soldier carrying it to the degree that he's familiar with it and are growing up from being a newborn infant actually this begins in the womb actually um but as you mature into a two-year-old and a three-year-old and become more tactilely skillful uh we're not born with absolute control over our limbs it's something that we develop over time so what we consider what we consider i or me to be um becomes a a serious uh question and a challenge but i don't think that using technology to battle pernicious kinds of technology means that uh we're giving up something of ourselves we are we are in some sense extending ourselves out across the the field before us and using what's before us to do what we want to do and to better ourselves yeah, but I think I'd, I'd have to disagree because it seems like it's a moot point if you didn't have that problem in the first place. So it's like I always get flack from the alt-right kids, right, when I talk about technology mm-hmm. because they say, you know, the retort is, well, if we you know, have technology like Facebook and all these social media platforms and Gab and whatever, mm-hmm. uh, we wouldn't be able to be fighting this system right now because it's because of these platforms that we can get on here and we can shit post and we can post articles and so on and so forth against this system but that's the entire point if right. it we're not for this system we wouldn't need to be doing guerrilla fucking tactics on facebook to fight facebook like if facebook didn't exist there would be no reason for any of this movement to exist like if if the technological industrial society did not exist the alt right would not exist because everybody would already be what we consider alt right these days they would already want to defend their family and their community and their country they would already you know live in a homogenous society it, it's technology that has put us in this position and now we're just trying to you know grasp what straws we can to fight back against the very thing that put us in this place well I think the, the, the problem, and this comes back to the whole necessity argument from the very beginning, the problem is that we live in a the jurisdiction of a state, a very militarily 
powerful state with a very powerful law enforcement agency and we've built laws around ourselves and we can't just do what we want within that or we'll get wakeoed right we'll get arrested for for doing something wrong and taken away so we we live in for for whether we want to or not in a world of constraints that our ancestors have left us with that's the, their legacy to us and they left it with us in the hopes that it would leave us better off than they had been and that their parents had been mm -hmm. and it's become more and more complicated and in some ways it has been in some ways not so much um but the alt-right kids are uh, when, when you talk about kids i'm i'm getting a particular kind of shit poster in mind and they're not very very careful in their in their thinking about these sorts of arguments but i think on on this point they're right in that we're not living in a parallel universe where we we could have done otherwise we are where we are in in the and we have the tools that are in front of us and not much else and i think that um I think that freedom, not freedom, I'm sorry, agency lies in using the tools at our disposal um, in order to in order to achieve what we think is best given the choices we have rather than rejecting the tools that have been left to us by our ancestors uh, and in doing so trying to free ourselves from the constraints that are their legacy. Well, what if someone maybe wasn't as gifted with social media as some of these 17 year old, you know, alt right trolls are? And what if he's an engineer who's much better at making bombs than at <laughs> using Facebook? Like, is it then legitimate for him to start an assassination campaign because that would be a way of attacking the system? Because like, that's. It's perfectly in line with using what your ancestors have given us i mean bombs I are definitely a western thing <laughs> i don't know what i'm allowed to say here i, I my, my first inclination this isn't a very serious point is that bombs are really more of a middle eastern thing to do but uh, <laughs> um <Touché. laughs> i i think that the the problem with kaczynski's strategy with bombing was that it seriously damn i mean his goal was I mean, it was technological in its manifestation, but fundamentally it was ideological. He was trying to get an idea out to help people. That was his idea. And I think, unfortunately, because of what Sun Tzu calls the moral law, right? It's, it's what he opens up the art of war with. He says the, the, there are five laws, and the mm -hmm. first law he gives is the moral law, and that's what motivates men to fight and to defend and what doesn't. He doesn't talk about it in moralistic terms, interestingly enough. He talks about it in psychological terms. And I think on that front, Kaczynski was counterproductive to his own stated aims. I think he made people afraid of seriously <laughs> dealing with his ideas. And maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just the circles I'm running around now. But it seems to me that gradually, slowly, people are beginning to take his ideas more seriously again. Um, or at least to try to deal with them for the first time in, you know, 10, 15 years or so. But he could have sped up that process quite a bit if he hadn't been running around uh, bombing people. Well, I don't know, man, because, you know, how many of those people who have read Kaczynski have read Jacques Ellul and his book, the Technological Society, which is what... Kaczynski's ideas were based on. Nobody's ever heard of that guy. Nobody's ever read of that book because mm, he enough. didn't have a 20-year bombing campaign. Mm -hmm. Kaczynski did. And so that dramatic example did it. And yes, it brought a lot of backlash on him and on his ideas, and they were you know, verboten for a long time. Um, but people say the same thing about Tim McVeigh, right? Blew up the federal building, those poor children in daycare. Like he knew there was a daycare center there. Blew up the federal building. It caused a massive black backlash by the Clinton administration on the Patriot Movement. So, you know, all the right wingers say, well, Tim McVeigh really fucked us on this one, you know, by doing the exact thing that Patriots were talking about for decades. He actually went and did it like a violent act against the federal government. And everyone blames him for the backlash. 
right. same thing that happened to us in Charlottesville. You know, everybody's shitting on the alt right and the right wing for doing unite the right because. Well, look what you guys did now. Now everybody hates the alt right. It's destroyed. Now they've torn down all our southern monuments, and it's all your guys' fault. But if you don't fucking do something, like and you know take action against the system, like of course there's going to be backlash. But if you keep doing nothing, like it's just going to keep avalanching all over you. Well, I certainly won't argue that there's never a time for violence. Right. I think I think only moral fools and people who haven't thought things through would make that point. There's absolutely a time for revolution and violent action, um, if you want. Um, as a, as an example of that, Vox Day over at his blog has variously been memeing about Saint Bravik. Pray for us. Now, one of the things that people <laughs> don't don't know about Anders Bravik is that he wasn't just attacking a. And I'm not trying to say this to defend. Or attack Anders Breivik. I'm just stating Vox Day's opinion here. Um, it, Breivik didn't just attack some random group of, of migrants or immigrants. He wasn't even specifically targeting migrants. What he was targeting was a left-wing Labor Party uh, youth leadership training camp. Mm -hmm. And supposedly the Labor Party has yet to recover from that attack. In terms of, in terms of uh, raising up the next generation of political leaders within their group, um, Voxe says to expect a lot more of these. But my my response to this whole thing about violence would be um, the the Romans had this phrase "carpe diem." It doesn't mean seize the day, as a lot of people think it does. So this is uh, from that uh, Robin Williams movie. It's seize the day. It's this romantic thing. That's not Dead what it means. Dead society. Yes, excellent Dead Post Society. Movie, it was an excellent movie. Uh, it means something closer to pluck the day. And it, it, it implies a deal of timing and patience. And it implies that, that the, the, the right moment is not necessarily the day. But to be aware of the, the possibility of a right time and to be prepared for it so that you can seize the day when the time arrives. Um, when this is some, one of the, the better things that I think Jordan Peterson has, has said in, in taking down this, this stupid modern Christian interpretation of the meek shall inherit the earth as some sort of like the pacifists will rule the world. It's not true. When you actually go back into the Greek, what the, what the meek word meant was something like those who have swords and know how to use them but but aren't quick to use them are the ones mm. who inherit the earth perfectly willing and able but but not that that's not their first yeah resort. i mean you're talking about the guy who said if you don't have a sword sell your cloak and buy one exactly so not a pacifistic philosophy mm. at all yeah uh, I think I think what turns people off and and the the question that you're you're raising essentially is is there such thing as bad publicity or is all publicity good publicity um, beyond our excellent and wonderful friend Richard Spencer I think history is replete with examples of people who who got plenty of publicity but their publicity did not do good things for their ideologies and those who are most effective seem to be the ones who patiently churn away for year after year after year sometimes decades on end and then one day seemingly out of the blue become 20 year overnight successes i think is the phrase that john molyneux says <laughs> you know <laughs> well i'd say i i don't think that publicity is really the issue <clears throat> when it comes to someone like kaczynski or bravik I, I think it's a matter of targets, and I, this is probably skirting the line on what's allowed on YouTube, but, you know, when I first heard of what happened with Breivik, um, I was taking the bar exam, and uh, my first thought, like, from the limited amount I knew was, what in God's name is this guy thinking? Of all the targets you could pick in all the world, you choose kids. Yeah. Like, that is absolutely the number one thing you do not do is target children nobody has your back on that one there is absolutely no one in the world is going to think bully 
Bully for you. Spot on, mate. That is awesome. Right. Like, everybody's going to fucking hate you, even your own people. But then, you know, all these years later, you, like you said, they still haven't recovered from that. And he, w I mean, he was wiping out the next generation of communist leadership in his country. Actually, it makes a lot of sense intellectually, but politically, it was a terrible move. Just like Kaczynski. If you think about his targets to the FBI and everyone else, they seem totally random. But if you know his philosophy, actually, it's with mathematical precision and perfect logic. You know, he's targeting airline executives, uh, these professors who are pushing this nonsense, uh, the people that he feels are responsible for the expansion of technological industrial society. Logically, it makes sense. Politically, disastrous, because common people just cannot grasp why someone would kill an innocent computer scientist, mm -hmm. you know, or an innocent uh, young <clears throat> young man who just wants to be politically active in his local, you know, Labor Party uh, youth group. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, if we really want to do away with technology, the fastest thing we could do would be to take an Evolian accelerationist approach, maybe up up our immigration a little bit and uh just let, let it collapse things, let things deteriorate faster yeah that's how that's how rome collapsed but things would get a lot uglier before they got pretty um based on the necessity i think i think those threats are worth repulsing for their own sake they give me a sense of meaning and, and reason to get up in the morning uh, dealing with <coughs> islam and and with the left and with the what you might call the forces of global capitalism which sounds weird to say as a as a capitalist myself but you you i'm, I'm sure most people understand the distinction um yeah i, I think those as long as it's not libertarians <laughs> listening to the show right right you can be a capitalist and oppose other cap the 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 forces of global capitalism um and i think for, for the for the sake of opposing those for the sheer enjoyment and power derived from um from learning about and developing a competence with certain technologies and based on the uh the fact that people prior to the industrial revolution also had severe amounts of stress and suffering and pain and psychological maladjustment um not more but probably not less than what we had um i i think that opposing industrial technology and and certainly taking a revolutionary violent approach to it is um not just the the wrong approach for a wrong goal but is probably going to be counterproductive well man i guess different folks different strokes mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's a. Uh, it's just like anything else there's a point where you just have to make the decision for yourself. Is this something like, is this the hill I want to die on? Um, is this actually necessary? And if it is necessary, how do you do it? Is it practical? Can it be done? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I just don't, I don't know if there's a, a way to sell that to the masses. And I think that's Kaczynski's point is that it has to be a vanguard of, you know, revolutionaries who are ready to die for it. I suppose um, I suppose I have to get going here and finish up, but I'll I'll close with one final question to you to see if we can maybe hit, if not common ground, then then leave the the listeners with an interesting perspective on this. Would you rather live in an industrial, and we could even say like post-industrial society, or would you rather live in an Islamic society? If it came down to it. I well, first of all, let me ask what I think I already know my answer. But what is uh, what is a post-industrial society? By by post-industrial, I mean after it's collapsed or or like after everything's fixed or what are we talking about? I, I'm talking about. I'm sorry, that was that was a, a poor phrasing on my part. I'm I'm thinking even more industrial than it is now, futuristic maybe even. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd rather I'd choose the, the more industrialized society. Because okay. I'm not a fucking Muslim. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a disease, you know. Like the the technology or the way it's turned out, anyway. Um, 
it's a disease in the Western soul, in my mind. But it's that still Faustian. the West. Still... Soul selling spirit. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's a Faustian spirit on overdrive to a self destructive purpose, but it's still like our culture, you know? It's mm-hmm. it's like, well, would you rather live in your family home that's been, you know, in your house for, you know, ten generations, or would you rather have these people from I don't know, fucking Zimbabwe come and rent you an apartment down the street? Like obviously I'm gonna stay in the family house that's been in my you know, on my land for 10 generations, you know, decrepit or, you know, disastrous as it may be, because it's my home. It's my family. Uh, and the West is my culture. So I'm still not convinced, but possible conclusion, Kaczynski was right, but the time is not quite yet. Well, I think he'd agree with you because he's on another point he makes an anti-tech revolution. He talks about the trends of revolutions and how they come to be. Um, saying that actually, you know, the, the example he used is the founding fathers who didn't really create anything new. They just accelerated a trend that was already on the way here in America. Uh, he gives several examples of that, but he's saying, you know, the technological society isn't going to just collapse on its own. And Hold it's on certainly one not second, going to collapse. Yeah. Sorry, had to make use of the indoor plumbing real quick. <laughs> it's all good. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think he'd say you can just destroy technological society. It has to be something that it's already coming down, and this vanguard has to go in and you know, help it on its way. Okay. So I, I, he'd agree with you that the time is just not now. Okay. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good place to end it. We've been going for about an hour and a half, so... It'll be interesting to see what the uh, what the commenters say down below, and uh, perhaps we can talk about this more in the future. Absolutely, man. I'm always there for you, buddy. All right. Pleasure chatting, Augustus. Take care. Back at you, man. Talk to you later.